Aaron Chu. Uh, so raise your hand if you might be interested in sticking around after five for a pop lab. Okay, so we can stick around for a while. And then there are and then, uh, you can also stay here till uh, nine o'clock. We are selling uh, till nine o'clock. Uh, but tonight uh, there is an event here, which is very big, and uh, maybe some uh, auditors come here and they will be here. Okay, so uh, for my last talk, um, Zena suggested that uh, I might uh, uh, give something of an overview of some of the uh, bits of work in the, uh, in the general area of monads and reasoning about effectful programs uh, that uh, I didn't have a chance to cover in the talk. And uh, as you can imagine, there are rather a lot of them. So I'm going to skip through uh, rapidly. Um, a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, exciting and interesting things that people have been doing in this area mostly over the last decade or so. And it's a very exciting area. There's been an awful lot of progress uh, in, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and people, uh, people address uh, these issues from a whole bunch of different perspectives. So some people are interested in the category theory, the abstract structures of effectful programs. Other people take those things on board but are more interested in building very concrete models for particular languages with particular effects. Some people are interested not quite so much in the models but more in the associated logics and reasoning principles. Um, some people are driven by not the language as a whole but how would they actually organize a proof of a particular program or a particular class of programs. A whole bunch of people are now interested in how you mechanize these kinds of models and reasoning principles in systems like Koch and others. Um, and then there's a very active community of people who take the ideas from these uh, semantic models and, uh, and program logics and focus very much on how they build automated or semi-automated tools for analyzing programs built on that theory. And finally, there's a whole bunch of people who are interested in coming up with better programming languages to express these kinds of effectful computation or to identifying useful programming patterns that you can use in existing programming languages. And what I want to do is kind of skip gaily across this whole perspective and try and show how some of the ideas that I've been talking about in previous lectures kind of arise from all these different perspectives. And there's a lot of commonality between, uh, uh, between the work that's being done by people who have different focuses. Foci. So starting with the, uh, starting with the abstract structure, um, so one of the things that uh, uh, I would have liked to talk about a bit more uh, is uh, the idea of arrows, prehibernoidal and Pride categories. So this is a this is a generalization of monads. So previously we were talking about having a base category and a monad, which is an endofunctor on that uh, on that category. So computations, we said we kind of imagined living up, say, in the Kleisley category or maybe in the Eilenberg Moore category, um, but um, but they can always be reflected back down into the world of values, and um, it's not actually necessary uh, to allow that moving back down again to have the fuller junction. If you uh, if you only ask for something weaker, you can come up with this notion of having a, a category of values and over that a category of computations and you'll require some product structure, monoidal structure or, or Cartesian structure in the category of values. And then the category of, uh, of computations is going to be something that kind of behaves like the Kleisley category does in the case of monads. But we don't need to ask for a functor coming back the other way. Um, and, uh, and such things are called... Um, Premonoidal categories or fried categories in the case that the base is uh, Cartesian. And so the structure that you get is a um, uh, symmetric monoidal base category and then a, what's called a premonoidal category of computations and, a, and an identity on objects functor uh, which takes the product uh, down below to the product up above. 
And what premonoidal means is that the, the, although there's a product for any two objects up in the category of computations, you don't require that this be uh, a functor. You only ask it to be uh, a bifunctor. You only ask it to be a functor in each of the variables separately. And this is the situation you get when you have a non-commutative monad on the base. You discover that uh, you can't take a, uh, an F and a G down uh, uh, in general in the computational world and, uh, and form... Um, so if you've got computations, uh, f from uh, a to b and uh, uh, g from c to d, then although you can form the product object uh, a cross c and b cross d, in general, uh, there, isn't a, there isn't a sensible notion of tensoring up f and g to go across here because each of these have some side effects. And so the order in which those side effects happen um, actually matters. So you get two kinds of ways of, of combining an F and G, one where F happens first and one where G happens first, and they're not generally equal, though they are equal if the monad is, uh, is commutative. Um, so this is, a, this is a nice generalization of, uh, of monads, and um, it roughly uh, corresponds to something which John Hughes came up with in the context of programming in languages like Haskell, which he called arrows. Um, and this has been used widely in Haskell programming, in particular for doing functional reactive programming uh, example. So uh, even, even programs to control robots and things have been structured with this, uh, uh, for this abstraction. And there's a nice associated syntax for this situation, which was originally due to um, Patterson and then got refined a bit by uh, Phil Wadler and some of his, um, his co-authors. And uh, this down here is a pretty picture generated by uh, Alan Jeffrey, who has proposed uh, a graphical language for working with premonoidal categories. And, uh, and in this is a, a three level split where he has a category of values, then he has a category of commutative computations, and then he has a category above that of non-commutative processors, and he has a very pretty uh, boxes and wires uh, language in which you can program and, uh, and do transformations on this, uh, this three-level setup. So another nice generalization of monads is due to Bob Atkey. Um, these are called parameterized monads, and it's a it's a fairly sort of natural-looking generalization. It turns out to be, very, to be very neat. So instead of just asking for, uh, uh, for, for T from, let's say, set to set to be a monad, we're going to feed into the definition of the monad um, both a, a covariant and a contravariant um, parameter. So, uh, so the generalization is that uh, you have an eta, and um, well, this is called mu, but it's more like the, uh, the Clifley operation. Um, so for any x, you can go to T of AAx for any A in... Um, in, in big A, and, uh, and the composition, here you can see that you can see the pattern. So we've got a computation, um, and then we've got a, 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 an x, and we've got a function, just as we do in the normal Clisley setup, we've got a function which takes an x to a computation of y, and we're going to get back a t of y, but the parameters plug together at the same time. So the x computation sort of takes you from a's to b's, um, and the, um, the continuation here takes you from b's to c's, and the overall computation will produce a y, but will take you from A's to C's, and there are, these are subjects from laws that generalize the, um, the monad laws. And uh, so, indeed, any, uh, any monad is uh, an example of this, but there are lots of other nice examples. So one obvious example is, um, is state transformers, where when you do computation, the type of the state is allowed to change. So, uh, so here, this is an example of a parameterized monad. So T um, of S1 and S2 and X is something that takes you from states of type S1 to values of type X paired with states of type S2. And if you put some uh, monoidal structure on these parameters, then you can come up with a very nice type system and, uh, and semantics for having separated computations, ones where, where one computation works on a little part of the state and another computation works on a, another part of the state. The second example of these parameterized monads is composable continuations. Um, so the normal continuations monad has a single return type, so T of X is X to R to R. Um, and here, we allow ourselves both a sort of input and an output return type. And these give you continuations which correspond to little delimited blocks of continuation and can be, can be plugged together. So T of R1, R2 of X is X to R1 uh, to R2. And if you've ever been baffled by delimited continuations, um, I urge you to go away and read Bob Ackie's paper on parameterized monads and his explanation of this because it's dramatically clearer than the explanations of composable continuations that you get from people with a more uh, operationally minded uh, uh, view of the world. 
So there are lots of, this, this notion that computations sort of uh, uh, take you forward in time will come up again in, in a couple of my later slides as well. So some of his other examples are to do with uh, permissions and session types. So these are, these are computations which are constrained to evolve according to some kind of state machine. So for example, if, you've, um, if, if you're interested in formalizing protocols of uh, interaction ac uh, across network devices where you're supposed to make a call of this sort first and then do something like this and then do something like that, m maybe with a little regular expression of, of the actions, um, then, uh, then you can encode that up in terms of parameterized monads in a very, uh, very elegant way. Yeah, you should, yeah, well, yes, he calls it mu. I got this from his paper on the subject, but yes, of course, it's, that's what I said. Yes, this is really the bind, not the mu, yes. <coughs> well, I mean, it's the multiplication in some generalized sense. So, uh, um. Okay, so uh, third topic on the, uh, on the foundations of all this that um, it would be nice to talk about is uh, algebraic effects. So this is a research program that was initiated by Gordon Plotkin and John Power, and uh, subsequently a lot of other people have worked on it too, including Martin Hyland. Um, and uh, so one of the things that was, uh, was perhaps questionable about the way I presented monads is that we focus entirely on the most boring aspect that all these notions of effect have in common, viz. that they're all monads, but the thing that's exciting about effects is the operations. They're the things that actually do the work and make all the, uh, make all the monads different from one another. And um, as I mentioned in the talk before, um, algebraic theories have a very close connection with monads. Um, indeed, some people say they're the same thing. And um, so this, um, uh, this approach to effects says, let's not start with, with the idea of monads. Um, let's instead start with the idea of operations. The operations are going to be the thing that define a notion of computational effect. If we start with all the individual operations together with the equations we expect them to satisfy, then we can generate a monad from that um, by extending kind of previous work on, um, on Lauvier theories and, um, and monads. So, for example, if you look at the theory of global state, then you have an operation for reading locations and an operation for writing locations um, for each one of the, one operation for each uh, location. If you take those primitive operations and you impose the following, I think, seven laws about the way that they're supposed to interact. So these say entirely obvious things about the state. So uh, this, for example, says if you uh, if you read a reference cell A find the result to V, and then you assign V straight into A, then that's the same as doing nothing. Um, and um, if you read a reference twice in succession, then it's the same thing as reading the reference once and using the value twice, and so on and so forth. These are obvious things, and the sorts of things I was talking about before as consequences of, of the kind of models we built. But here, instead, we, we impose these as, as desiderata, as the equations. And from this, you can build the state monad that we have before. Uh, and the same thing works for various other notions of effect. So one of the reasons this is a nice way of doing things is that this age-old problem of how you combine monads and how you do monad transformers and now has a new, there's a new approach to that because combining algebraic theories is something where, I mean, immediately you can see that if you've got a bunch of operators and equations and another bunch of operators and equations, you can union them together and um, then go off and generate uh, the monad that's generated by that combination and uh, that gives you the, uh, the sum of uh, algebraic effect um, and the other thing you can do is you can take the one theory and the other theory and put them together and then add extra equations that says all the operations from one theory commute with the operations from the other. And that gives you the tensor of, um, of monads. And uh, the, the combination monads you build this way correspond to, uh, to various known uh, uh, ways of building monads from the, from the other perspective. So, uh, so this, this approach doesn't work for every monad. In the most notably, it doesn't work for the continuation monad. Um, and... Uh, it needs a little bit of refinement over what I just said for it to even work for something as simple as uh, exceptions. So the algebraic approach lets you raise exceptions but doesn't really account for the way that exceptions come along with the notion of handling, which consumes the effect. Um, and so, uh, so Gordon and, uh, and one of his students, uh, Mattia Pretnar, um, have extended this algebraic theory to include destructors for effects, which gives you a now a very nice dual calculus in which uh, effects can be raised and effects can be, can be dealt with. And uh, Mattia and uh, Andre Bauer are currently building a new programming language entirely based on this algebraic notion of effect. So, there's a technical idea that I th should call out. Um, this technical idea is called biorthogonality or top top lifting. Um, so, this is due, I guess, to Crevine originally um, and, uh, and Pitts. And then uh, there's been some very nice work on it by Shinya Katsumata. So, um, so I was trying to make a big fuss about how 
Uh, we wanted to be compositional and how we were interested in contextual equivalence and everything should be well behaved with respect to putting it in context. And, um, and quite often we have, a, we have a property of terms that we write down and it's not, it's not naturally contextually uh, closed. It looks a little bit over-intentional. There's a very general thing which does many things, but amongst other things it, uh, it kind of contextualizes things. So the general big, big picture is that we'll often be working with, with configurations of a system which consist of a program and the environment in which we've put it. Um, there's always this dual structure. Um, and if we take some notion of observation, which we could just take to be a subset of uh, the set of all configurations, for example, termination or divergence or something like that, um, and we have a predicate P on programs, these guys, then there's a way to flip the predicate over to be a predicate on uh, environments instead. So P top is a set of all environments such that for all P in, the, in big P, the thing you get by plugging together P and E is in your observation. And there's a dual operation which takes any predicate over environments and flips it over to a predicate on programs. So the, the predicate uh, E top is, is the set of all programs that whenever you plug them together with an E in big E, you end up with something uh, in O. So if you go around the loop, um, you end up with a closure operator on the set of, uh, on the set of programs. So this is inflationary idempotent operation, which takes an arbitrary property of programs and kind of contextualizes it. Um, so in various concrete contexts, this has all sorts of side effects. So, so for example, in domains, if you, uh, if you take observations to be uh, divergence, and so you know, you're plugging together of these two things is the application of a, uh, a continuation to a, a function into the two-point set, Sapinski space, um, and uh, applied to your, to your value. Uh, then when you top, top, close it, uh, whatever the predicate you started with uh, is, you end up with something which is admissible, something which is closed under limits of change, and which also has some other uh, interesting properties.